Joining us now is Dustin Kaleopu. He and his grandfather made a harrowing escape from Lahaina um, as the flames engulfed the city. We are thankful that you made it out safely. Share with us what happened and how you got your grandfather out. Thank you for having me. Honestly, as it was for so many people with the hurricane force winds, the fire moved very quickly and we left with nothing but the clothes on our backs. Um, I mean, the smoke was starting to come through our windows. By the time we got in our car, our neighbor's yard was on fire. There were strangers in our yard with their water hoses trying to put fires out. Um, but it, it happened very quickly and we were some of the lucky ones. I know so many people were not able to make it out of their homes. And we're starting to see that now as the death toll has risen and it continues to rise. And I'm sh well, I would not be surprised if it doesn't reach triple digits today. Wow. Oh, it, I mean, it is hard to see these images. Um, and we are so grateful that you and your grandfather were able to get out. Do you know anything else about other family members, about your neighbors? Have you been able to connect with others? When we evacuated, we made it very quickly compared to some people um, to the opposite side of the island. So we've not been back to Lahaina. But currently, there's been a large group of community members trying to step in and fill in the gaps where service is needed to help out those people that are still on the west side of the island. So I know people are making their way out there today with food and supplies and clothing, water, there's no electricity, no running water in West Valley right now. So community members have been organizing for the last two days since the fire started on how to get these supplies back to the folks in the island. The images, the footage we're seeing from Maui, it just looks completely apocalyptic. People were jumping into the ocean to stay safe. The death toll is mounting. I'm just wondering, from your point of view, how much of a warning did you get and how much of like a safety um, passageway out were you aware of? It seemed like this caught everyone off guard. There was no warning, and I commend the fire and police for the hard work that they were doing. The way the fire moved, it was so quick that there was no time for anyone to be coming through the streets on the megaphone telling us to evacuate. It was word of mouth. We had to figure it out for ourselves. But I know the fire department and the police department was already working so tireless, tirelessly to help the folks that they could. Um, and that's just what it was. We had to figure it out. Uh, I see that you are in, uh, it looks like Pukalani right now. And that's about <laughs> um, about uh, 30 some miles um, uh, fr um, uh, from the, the worst of it, from, from um, your home. Um, and tell us, are you staying with family members there, what was it like to try and find shelter? What was that escape uh, like and, and the search for a, a safe place to find refuge? Unlike many people that I know, we luckily have family members that are spread out across the island. And we had a cousin call us and say that her home was open to us. There's about 13 of us staying in here right now. I have my mom, my brother, my grandpa, my dad, my stepdad. We had family visiting us from the island of Molokai. Um, we're just grateful. Not many people have the ability to be in a comfortable home like we do. A lot of people are still finding refuge in shelters, camping at beaches, or staying in their cars. It sounds like you have the most important thing, you know, 13 of your family members all around you, supporting you, you're all together and safe. I'm wondering if you know at all the condition of your home or if you're thinking, maybe it's too early to think, if you'll ever be able to go back, if there's anything to go back to. I've seen the aerial footage and there's nothing to go back to for anyone in the whole town. All of um, my neighborhood was completely destroyed. Um, my grandparents' house completely destroyed. My mother's house, my brother's house, everyone that I know, I've seen their houses just brought down to piles of ash. There's nothing recognizable in the rubble. And I wouldn't know what I was looking at if I were to make it back home, or at least to where home used to be. Dustin, um, a lot of people know Maui from vacations and from images of Hawaii. But uh, Lahaina has a particular importance for, um, for Hawaiian culture, for the Hawaiian people. Talk to us about 
the significance of your hometown, of your cultural heritage, and some of what was lost in this fire? Absolutely. Lahaina was the first capital of the Hawaiian kingdom, and a lot of the structures, uh, a lot of the historical sites were landmarks um, representing that time in our history. Uh, there was also the plantation era where many of our family members came from different countries overseas to work in the sugar and pineapple plantations and help to build this community. And it's just a lot of different history. But what I've shared with other folks is that for the Hawaiian people especially, we never had a written language and our history was recorded orally through song and dance and chant. And we'll continue to have those memories, those stories to tell. It's unfortunate that we don't have the memorabilia, the artifacts anymore, but as a people, we're strong enough to keep that spirit of Lahaina alive and keep that memory going of what we knew and loved. Dustin, we so appreciate you sharing that with us, as well as how harrowing the past few days have been. It's encouraging to know you've got your family there with you um, in a safe place now. Please do stay in contact with us, because we understand it'll be a Thank very you. difficult number of weeks ahead, and we send you all of our support. Thank you. Aloha. Where were you before the fire started? I was at work. Um, driving into work that day, we knew that that side of town had no power. We knew that there was high winds, um, nothing about a fire until, I can't even remember, maybe after 1 p.m. or so. Did you evacuate that day? No. You stayed in the um, hotel? I tried twice, um, but was unsuccessful. Why were you unsuccessful? There was a lot of cars on the road and I got maybe about five, ten minutes down from the road, uh, down from the hotel I worked at. And just out of panic and fear, I said, you know what, this is the wrong. I, I, I got to get off the road. Let me get back out. Let me go back to the hotel. I need reception. I jumped on the road initially because I was desperate to find reception because I had no way of contacting my son and my, my husband to let, let them know where I was. More importantly, to make sure that they were okay too. Oh my God, you're, you're on this road. It is your way to safety, home to your family. And it must be bumper to bumper traffic at this point. Yes. What was going on in your mind? Were you panicked? Were you afraid? It was a kind of fear and panic that I have never experienced before in my life. Um, the second time I got on the road, it was a desperate attempt to make sure that someone picked my son up from football practice. It was already after six o'clock and practice finished at six. And the last thing that I did before I had re before my reception cut off was letting the people asking me if he needed a ride, letting them know that I had taken care of it cared of it and I was on my way out. So my fear initially was that my son was sitting alone in the dark at a park, maybe surrounded by a fire. I continued to drive into Lahaina in hopes that the closer I got, the stronger reception I would get, maybe some notifications would start pinging on my phone. Um, during the second time I tried to get out, bumper to bumper traffic, but the traffic was still moving into Lahaina, which gave me the sense of hope and security, I guess you could say, that it was safe to continue heading in that direction. There was little to none cars headed back north into Kanapali, which also gave me the reassurance that I could continue to head in that direction. Oh my God. Um, you had no idea that as you were evacuating, you were actually heading into the firestorm. I didn't know. I didn't know until there was big black mushroom clouds of smoke continuing to stack up on each other, bigger and bigger. And I got a little bit of reception. I called my husband and I said, I don't think I should continue. The road is still open, but I'm not sure. I don't know, I'm scared. And then I lost reception again. What you're describing is so much misinformation, miscommunication. You unknowingly were heading into the danger zone. 
willingly, unknowingly, blindly headed into the fire. How did you, did you see something that just said, I got to get out of here? Yeah, so I, I sat there for maybe another five, ten minutes after I cut out a reception. And the only traffic coming into Lahaina was guys on mopeds, on bicycles, on motorcycles. And I don't know who this guy was, but he probably saved my life. Um, there was a guy packing three kids on his motorcycle. He stopped to talk to the lady in the car in front of me and he told her, cousin, I love you, but you gotta turn around because if you continue to head into Lahaina, you're not gonna make it out alive. The fire is taking over Taco Bell and it's burning down Friend Street. I love you. I don't know if I'm gonna see you again, but I gotta go, I gotta get my kids to safety. Once I heard that, I realized I didn't know where my safe place was. And the only option I had at that, one, that point was to turn around and go back to work. Did you have any notice, any evacuation alert issued to you? Was there any communication in these first few hours of that panic state? No, nothing. You go back to the hotel. What happens over the course of the next day or two? We're still in the dark. We have no power. We have maybe two or three spots that would give us a little bit of reception. And that is when all of the guests and the associates would crowd in that area, hoping that that would be enough just to make that one phone call, send that last text. And um, we ran out of everything. You know, we ran out of everything, including our patience and sanity at some points, because there was a lot of upset people. There was a lot of emotional hotel workers there. There was a lot of sad stories and uh, my, my team members coming back to work, smelling like fire. Um, in ash, black, crying, telling me, I don't have nothing left except this shirt. Can I please stay here? Of course, please come. Um, as a manager there, you try and keep all of this away from them and just try and stay strong and you continue to push through those emotions for the sake of for everybody else because that's just how we're programmed. On the other hand, you have scared and emotional guests not knowing. And there was a point to where all I could tell them was, we don't know. For Maui, based on the information that I have, which is no more than what you guys have, if you ask me, this is uncharted territory. We have never seen this before. My entire life, I have never had, I have never thought that my home, Maui, would be the top of the national disasters all over, spread all over the news. It's a bad dream. It's something that I don't think any of us were prepared for. I can tell you're an amazing boss to so many. How many days did you guys go without water and food and just the basic necessities? I'd say a good the first day was hard, Tuesday was hard, Wednesday was hard. By Wednesday, we were able to provide coffee in the morning. We were able to make sandwiches and hot dogs. Um, there was a point to where we could only provide food for the children. And that was just all we could do. There was no way food could get in or out. There was a point in time to where I had to step back and ask myself, there's an airport right up the road. Why isn't that being used? There's an ocean front 20 feet from our lobby. Why are we not using that? I don't know. It's heartbreaking because there was ways to get help to you. And it sounds like for several days, 
you're not just dealing with your own emotions. You have tourists who know nothing about the island who are panicked as well. Yes. With not enough gas, not enough water. Um, when the fire got close enough, we couldn't see the fire. I was gauging how close the fire was based on when I could smell the smoke and how big the glow of orange was close to our hotel. There was a point to where you couldn't see it. You, you had to climb up through the parking structure to see the glow. Ugh. And then there was a point to where you didn't have to do that. And you could just see it. It was there, it was close. I honestly don't know if it was my mind playing tricks on me about the, if the fire was close enough that I could smell it. I was convinced that it was close enough. You know, I, I, I was stuck there for two days. When I decided to drive out Wednesday night, I didn't know if the road was open. I didn't know if the fire stopped. But that was where I drew the line and said, I need to get out. I need to go and I'm just gonna make, I, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take this chance and I'm, I'm going out on a prayer and maybe even a miracle at this point, God, please be with me. And I prayed the whole way out, just asking God to guide me out safely. And you were able to make it out? Yes. And yet the aid wasn't able to make it into you guys? Not as fast as they, not as fast as we wanted it to. When was the first time you started to see the government step in and provide some of those basic necessities? Say maybe Thursday. It started to sound like they started to have conversations based on the information and oh social God. media and YouTube and news. You know, it's from what it sounded like the community took it into their hands first. Are you a first responder? No. You have no experience responding to natural disasters. No. You're telling me you were able to make it out of that area and yet food was not able to make it in, food delivered by the government. Yes. What's your message to the county who from day one has said they're doing everything in their power to get help? Do you feel like they could have done more? It's hard, it's really hard. It's, I feel like there's so much more that could have been done in different ways, you know? And like you said, I'm not a first responder. I'm not a government official and I'm, I'm a politician in any way. I don't know. I don't have any say or my hands in any part of that. Um, but coming from the hospitality industry, we did everything we could there, you know? And I just feel like feel like there should have been more done sooner, faster. My last question, you now know, based on just the images alone, what happened in Lahaina. You were trying to get into Lahaina. You thought it was safe because you had no idea where to go. Now seeing those images, what goes on in your mind? It's heartbreaking. Um, I know for sure that if I had made it in there, hearing, hearing stories of children crying, um, the thought of those children's parents being on this side of town, hearing stories of elderly people crawling on the ground, begging for someone to pick them up. There are parts of me that wish I did make it in to help those lives. But there is a huge piece of me that thanks God that I didn't. The fact that I was alone, I would have needed someone to pull me out and to tell me when to stop. It's tragic. Have you lost any friends or colleagues? I don't know yet, and um, I heard that today they're supposed to be releasing the names of the hundred or so victims that have been recovered and identified so far. 
and you can almost feel the sadness and the anticipation of that list here, um, just in the energy on the island of Maui. It's, it's something that nobody is looking forward to seeing. As the death toll from the Maui fires climbs, first responders are searching for the missing. We are also hearing stories from survivors who were able to escape. Maui resident Pamela Reeder sent us these photos. She, her husband, and their two daughters were able to escape. Their house was burned down, and she says one of her friends still cannot locate his parents. Those pictures are tough to look at. Pamela joins us now. Pamela, I'm so sorry for everything that you've been going through. Can you just tell me a little bit about how you and your family are doing right now? Thank you. Um, we are doing okay. We are safely in a rental in South Maui, which is on the other side of the island. And we're just being surrounded by a lot of love and support, which is helping tremendously. So we're doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those pictures are really tough to look at. I, I understand that one of your friends still cannot find their parents. What can you tell us about that? That's right. Um, they abandoned their car is all we know, mm -hmm. and they cannot find them in any of the um, shelters or anything. So they're just holding out hope that they might be somewhere without phone service or just um, a lot of people are really out of sorts right now that had escaped. So they're just holding on to hope right now. Pamela, when I when I look at these pictures and I hear stories like that, it just brings me back to 2018. Um, I was covering the Paradise Fire in California, and there were so many people searching for loved ones. And you know, just looking at these pictures is so reminiscent of that. You're a real estate broker, and I know you understand. You know, when you when you look out at the landscape there, there's there's nothing left. I, I'm curious what's going through your mind in terms of just the rebuilding process and what it's going to look like there in Hawaii. Well, you know, Lahaina is a historic town and it is somewhere where I think so many of us have just felt so blessed to live mm -hmm. every single day. I've been a Maui resident now for 22 years and we just want to rebuild. We know it's a harrowing road ahead of us, but it is such a special place that, you know, I mean, it is crazy. Five minutes north, it looks like nothing happened. Mm. And, um, you know, this our whole town's gone. It's insane. <laughs> I'm just seeing some pictures I haven't seen before here. So, um, yeah, I mean, the hope is we will rebuild sooner than later. Obviously, there's a long road ahead, and it's just surreal right now. I mean, my whole neighborhood's gone. My whole community are places we go to eat dinner, where my daughters get ice cream, and... So, yeah, we're just, we're devastated. And, but, um, and how about horrible. where your daughters go to school? So um, we are very fortunate. My daughter's school, Maui Prep, is about 20 minutes north of Lahaina, and it is unscathed. It is also oh. where my husband works. They are the only school in West Maui that's opening. And so they are doing everything they can to admit as many students as humanly possible. Um, all the public schools in West Maui had gotten a notice that for right now, uh, luckily, uh, Princess Nahiana and uh, the Lahaina Intermediate School and Lahaina Luna are all still standing, but they're obviously in a in pictures like you're looking. They're right close to these areas, so they can't open anytime soon. And then we did lose an elementary school and a Catholic school. So anyway, Maui Prep is opening its doors. You know, we have teachers at our school, like my husband that lost their homes. Um, it is a tuition-based school, so they've actually cr uh, created a disaster relief fund because they have to be able to pay the teachers in this horrible time, but they also want to meet the community where the need is. And, um, you know, we are a really small school, so we're going to be busting at the seams, but I think it's obviously going to be well worth it and hopefully get as many kids back to normal as possible. Absolutely. So we're actually supposed to start school Monday. Oh, wow. Which seems crazy, but we're going to try. Yeah, it seems like a daunting task at this point, but glad to hear that the school is unscathed. Pamela, some of the residents have discussed receiving little warning before the fires. I'm curious, did your family have any warning? Um, 
Technically, no, there was no evacuation order, nothing. I will say it happened so fast that I don't know what could have been done, although maybe the sirens is what, you know, one thing. I will say a Maui County lifeguard who we're friends with, Anthony Cappadonia, he came to our house and told us it's time to go. And um, my husband's an actual ocean lifeguard in the Hamptons every summer. And so he heard his friend tell him to get out. And that's what I think made my husband leave when we did. Um, so we are very grateful to Anthony. He had been on a bicycle driving around our neighborhood, just telling people to get out covered in soot. And I think that's what made people take him seriously. He was clearly near the fire and, and we knew it was coming closer. And then by the time we got to our car, which wasn't that far, but when we got to the car, we saw flames, maybe a block and a half away, two blocks away. Wow. Sounds like your guardian angel. We're so, so thankful that you and your family made it out. We are thinking of you and everybody Thank there. Thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you, so much. Thank you. The Maui wildfires have destroyed a devastating number of homes and businesses and left nearly entire communities in ashes. But we are seeing some cases where buildings have been spared. Joining us now is Caleb Hopkins. He's the co-owner of three restaurants in Hawaii, two of them located in Lahaina, and they survived the fires. Caleb, it's good to see you. Uh, maybe perhaps, or definitely not the best of circumstances, but this is a story of resilience and how you and other businesses are trying to move along. So we are, are glad to talk to you. Tell us a little bit more about your restaurants. Name check them for us if people are interested. And how is it that they survived the flames? So the two restaurants on Front Street are called uh, Dekine and Mala Ocean Tavern. Um, I have no idea how they survived. It's an absolute miracle. Everything around it is just decimated. Caleb, where were you during the fires, and, and how did you manage to, to get out? Can you paint a picture for us, walk us through it? Yeah, so I was at those restaurants. Um, we had had really bad windstorms, and we had no signal, um, no communication, um, no power all day long. So I was just meeting with my GMs and my chefs, trying to make a plan to save product. My family, my wife, my Mother-in-law, father-in-law, and my two small children were in my house, which is about a mile down the road, down Front Street. Um, I went home, started seeing the smoke. Uh, we were told at 1 o'clock that the fire was 100% contained, so we weren't worried about it at all. But then we started seeing smoke, and we started getting a little concerned. Um, fast forward to about 4.15, we started seeing a lot of smoke the wind kind of shifted because it was blowing the other direction so it wasn't as noticeable and then the wind shifted back and all of a sudden it was black smoke everywhere um mm -hmm. we started to grab the kids and grab this stuff and get in the minivan and at that point we started seeing flames on our neighbors houses and palm trees were burning and cars were everywhere um i had seen lots of where to go because there was a tree down on one section of Front Street, which is creating some of that um, traffic that you saw. And so we took a little side route and uh, we got away just in time. It's wow. incredible. Um, you, 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 I want to go back to something you said at the beginning, though, that you weren't getting any sense of notice from local authorities about the storm or anything for several hours. Is that what you said? We had updates from 1 p.m. on. So nothing from 1 p.m. OK, so how has this affected uh, your employees? Because I imagine, you know, it's, it's hard to try to keep a business afloat when you're, everyone's trying to get their life back in order. Well, almost every single employee lost their homes and right. lost everything. So we have a business, but it's in the hot zone. So it's not like they're going to get back to work anytime soon. So our goal right now is just finding them housing, keeping them fed, getting them generators. Um, we've got a WhatsApp group with communication with everyone. Um, we have another restaurant called Pizza Paradiso up in Hanukkah, and that's our rally point because there's still, this is the first news I've seen. There's no, on the west side, there's still no internet. Um, my business partner has Starlink that he got set up today, which is the only reason I'm able to join you guys. Mm. Um, but the rest of the west side of Maui, all of our employees and everyone are just in the dark right now. You know, I'm curious, Caleb, you know, we keep seeing these haunting images of all of these burned out cars stretched along um, a, a roadway where so many people could not escape. Where is your restaurant in comparison to that? 
Uh, the cars that you see, the ones she seen, they all keep showing. It's about a quarter of a mile from there, my house and my and my restaurants. And you just happened to make it out on time, taking a, a different road out. How are you? Yes. How are you processing the fact that you made it out and your restaurants are are still standing? Well, there's definitely the survivor's guilt. You know, some of the most amazing restaurants in the world are in Lahaina. I mean, that's what we're known for is is having a, a Mai Tai, glass of wine, and watching a sunset. You know, you look at all these places like Sale Pepe, Lahaina Grill, Pacifico, all these awesome restaurants. I mean, down the hatch, our sister restaurant is just gone. It's just rubble. You know, it just showed it. You can't tell, but I recognize it. Wow. Uh, Caleb Hopkins, thank you so much for joining us. And we are so thrilled to hear that your family is safe and, um, you know, our hearts are hurting for all your employees and everybody in your community. We'll definitely keep you in our prayers. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Meanwhile, thousands of people who evacuated from those fires are figuring out what's next. You're seeing footage from Lahaina residents who were able to evacuate during the fires. Many homes in the community have been completely leveled. One couple that was forced to make a dramatic escape fled Lahaina, leaving behind everything as flames engulfed their home, including the nursery they had prepared for the child that they expect any day now. And Kevin Campbell and Tasha Anderson join us now. It's good to see both of you and the, the sweet touches that you were actually giving uh, <laughs> Tasha. Kevin, you were rubbing her back um, in, the, in the break there. So, Kevin, let's just start off by with you, because storms are common in your area. When did you know that this was different? Um, so I woke up that morning at 4 in the morning, and I just wanted to check on all the boat yards and um, the boats in the harbor and see if I could help with anything. There was a lot of messes already. Um, anything that wasn't tied down was getting blown around. And and that's kind of when I knew it might be a, a worse storm than what we had expected as far as wind goes. Um, so I've been, you know, cleaning up messes and trying to get ready for the storm around that time. So we um, just prepared to hunker down with our friends and family. We got a big generator and stuff as soon as as soon as you know we could to save our food and maybe try to um, watch a movie and hide out with everybody. And um, so I would just say, just as as soon as I woke up that morning, the the winds were heavier than what I've used to seeing, even for um, you know other big storms. And Tasha, you're eight months pregnant. How difficult has that made this last week for you? Um, yeah, it's definitely been difficult. We actually went to the doctor. I'm 38 weeks this week. So we went to the doctor last week, and he said just based on the stress and everything, he feels like baby might be coming earlier. Um, so really our first priority was finding a home that we could bring him back from the hospital to which we have thankfully been able to secure just for the next six months. Um, so it's been, every day is a little different. Every day is a little wavy. I have these huge waves of gratitude for everyone in our community that's come together to make it possible for us to stay here on Maui. And then there's also waves of extreme sad sadness and devastation for everyone who didn't make it out and don't have a home to go to. Oh, well, I, I can't imagine what you guys are going through. Can you talk to us about what that experience was like as you were protecting your little guy and, and trying to make it out of Lahaina and, and seeing the destruction that was all around you? I was, I was pretty adamant about not leaving, honestly. I was like, this is our home. This is where we built our home and our nursery. Everything was there. Um, if it weren't for Kevin, we probably wouldn't have left. Uh, he definitely made that call for the both of us, for all of us. I mean, we we would have had to run at some point. I just made the call a little earlier. I went. I took my scooter for a ride to go try and check on the fire that we were starting to see smoke from, just to see if we were going to be able to get away or if it made sense to stay. This is a dangerous time to be on the roads when you have trees coming down. It's a concern even just to drive anywhere. I didn't want to put Tasha in danger. 
doing that and there was stopped traffic. But when I got to the highway and could look down the road and see the flames and how fast the fire moving, um, I came back to the house in a panic and tried to get the people that I could get to get in the cars with us to go and grab. We didn't grab anything extra. It was like I felt like we couldn't leave fast enough. Enough. It was really, really scary. The um, if you saw the smoke, you know, and you didn't run right then with the winds traveling that fast, it was going to get to you um, at a speed where you couldn't walk away or run away from it. I I know what it's like when you're preparing for a child, and you you mentioned Tasha. Um, having that nursery and putting all those things together. And Kevin, as you just said, you left without bringing those things. Do you have what you need to bring your little guy home from the hospital? Yes, we have been so blessed with the community um, up country. One of Kevin's friends from high school, so from Hana, beyond Tremont. she um, lived up country, so we were able to stay with her, and she kind of rallied all of her mom friends to get us everything that we need. I mean, you know, it's like, it's kind of funny putting together a nursery and being like, whew, I'm done, and then doing it all over again. Um, so it's been difficult, but definitely more than anything, we're just grateful that we have this community that's pulled together for everybody. Well, we are wishing you all the very best. Kevin Campbell, Tasha Anderson, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you.